Hi everybody, my name is Jens Larsen. Ed Bickert is sort of the secret superhero of jazz guitar. You probably haven't heard of him unless you're around people who've checked out a lot more jazz because then you'll only hear about Schofield and George Benson and Wes Montgomery, Joe Pass, people like that. But as soon as you start digging a little bit deeper, then Ed Bickert is probably one of the first names that's gonna pop up. Uh, he hasn't done a lot of sort of work with, with more famous uh, musicians, so he's on two Paul Desmond albums. I think that's probably where you're gonna find him first. Uh, and for the rest, he's mostly just on the, on the scene in Canada. But his playing is really worthwhile checking out. I think he has a great sense of melody and he's also extremely good at um, incorporating chords into his solos. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar, improve the way that you solo, check out some interesting chord voicings or arpeggios, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to make sure not to miss anything, then click the little bell notification icon. I actually don't know that much about Ed Bickert beyond listening to his music and to his albums. Uh, and I've been planning to do a video on him for some time. I was originally going to do a track of uh, Pure Desmond, but then I came across a video with a transcription of the entire solo of the track that I'm doing here, which is uh, Have You Met Miss Jones on a trio album. Uh, and I thought that was such a great solo that I decided to do that one instead. If you want to check out the entire transcription, then check out Francois Leduc's channel and his uh, Patreon also. Uh, I'll link to the transcription and also to his Patreon in the description of this video. <laughs> As I said in the beginning, I really like how Ed Bickert has a really strong sense of melody and also how he's using chords. And this first example is, is really the perfect example of this. The first part of it is really just a melodic statement that he's then going to be using as a motif. So we get the... This part of the statement with the large interval. He uses a lot of six intervals in his playing. And then he adds another layer uh, by just adding sort of the, the basic part of a D7. And this is just really as comping, it's, it's really just meant as stating the harmony under the A note. But from here, he continues and he develops the original uh, motif that he stated, so the... Um, so this part, but now harmonized. And then moving on into the next part of the, the solo. So he's really sort of blurring the lines between when something... First we get a single note melodic motif, then we get some comping under that, just one chord, and then he continues with the development of that motif, but now harmonized. In the second part of this example, Ed Bickert is really starting to change the harmony. So this is the last four bars of the form, and uh, usually that would just be sort of a two turnarounds, so like A minor, D minor, G minor, C7, and then some sort of one, six, two, five. Uh, the bass player is, uh, actually the bass player is Don Thompson, and he's playing uh, just the 3625, so A, D, G, C, and then a C pedal, which he also does in the theme. Uh, so, because this is the first chorus of the solo, so we're kind of still building up a bit, and uh, the, most of this is in, in two, uh, and, and there's really room to for more to happen still. Uh, but the way Ed Bickert is playing this is, he's coming out on the, on the B flat seven at, at the end of uh, the first part, and then he goes to A minor, and then the way that I would interpret the, the first two bars here is really just A minor and then A flat minor because he plays this triad, so a B triad, which could be like a, an A flat minor, G minor. Normally you would go to C7, but uh, what he does is he actually just goes back up, so you get the, the B triad again, and then back to the A minor, so uh, to the to the C triad, which is then, you can think of that as being an A minor in bar 3 or an F major 7. That's incomplete. Uh, at this point, the bass player is just playing a C pedal. And then he starts moving around just using, because this is of course all parallel movement, so he's just moving that triad up to a D flat, and we have the C in the bass, and then up to an E flat. And then in the beginning of the next chorus, uh, we get sort of a, a suspension of the F major 7. So of course the, the beginning of the song is on F major 7, but uh, what he plays is really this A flat minor triad, which I think would, you would have to consider an E major 7. And then on the 4, he's resolving that up to, uh, up to the F major 7. 
by just playing the, the A minor triad. And then on B3 of the second bar, we get this uh, quarter chord. And you can, I would say it makes the most sense to think of that as being the top part of a, of a D7. And then finally, he kind of resolves that whole motion, not at the beginning of the chorus, but two bars into the chorus, by just playing this low sustained G minor to just sort of resolve everything. You can actually find a few examples of Ed Bickert uh, improvising with how he's playing these turnarounds at the end of the form uh, and uh, in the theme. So just before the solo, the way that he, he starts the solo is really just by, the, again, we get a C pedal in the bass and then he's playing sort of an F major seven, sharp 11 to an A flat major seven to a D flat major seven to a G flat major seven and then kind of starting the solo with just like a sustained F major seven chord. This second line is coming out a few choruses later and then I'm again including the last part of the chorus simply because I thought it was a really beautiful line where he's managing to really spell out the changes of the final turnaround and displace the harmony only using a few notes per chord. So on the F major 7 he comes out with first just this, the 7, so the E, moving down to the flat 9 on the D7 and then up to the C. To resolving the E flat down to D and then going to the flat 9 on the C7, so the D flat and then up to the 7th and then adding the 13 and resolving that on the one of the next chorus with an F. The next part of this example is extremely simple, it's just a diatonic melody but it's also extremely strong and uh, it's in fact it is so strong that I'm wondering if it's actually a quote from some song that I, I don't know uh, because it seems almost unbelievable that he's just improvising it. So he comes out on the F and we have this sort of one note statement and then we get a response to that that's um, like a descending Coltrane pattern, a C, ma C major Coltrane pattern. And notice that of course if you just do that's kind of boring but rhythmically there's a lot more happening. happening. Then the C is used in the same way as the F but now he's just making the variation of repeating it and then we get another, uh, well actually it's a, kind of another Colton pattern as a descending movement. So we have... And then he goes into another motif to, that's moving up, just to sort of balance, balance things out. So first we just move up from A to C, repeating that, and then adding a tag to it. As you can tell, I really think that this is a very strong melody to improvise uh, and that's why I'm thinking that maybe it is a quote. So let me know what you think. If you know that this is actually another song, then leave a comment. That would be kind of, I would be kind of curious to know. And for the rest, I would say that I'm extremely impressed with how, how strong that phrase is. The reason that I can keep on publishing videos every week is that I have a community of people over on Patreon that are supporting the channel. I'm very grateful for that and I don't think it would be possible for me to keep on making all these very specific jazz guitar videos without their support. If you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. If you join us over there, then I can also give you something in return for your support. Applying another meter or using other meters on top of the 4-4 is actually also something that Ed Bicker does really often. And I didn't really talk about that in the two previous examples, but this example is really about that. So he's using a 3-4 pattern uh, on top of the 4-4 and in that way uh, just sort of making phrases move around and displacing them and at the same time still making sort of a coherent melody and resolving it in a natural way. I think this is also quite a a fascinating phrase in that respect. So this is in the drum chase, he's uh, coming in on the bridge on the B flat major 7 
and uh, the first phrase is really just a leading note up to the root, so to the B flat, up to the fifth of the chord. Then in the next bar we get an A flat minor D flat seven to take us to G flat major seven, and the way he does that is that he's playing. I think it's pretty much like just thinking the D flat seven, but he moves up the lower part of uh, of these two so that you get a leading note up to the B, so B flat up to the B or the C flat, up to F, which is kind of spelling out the D flat seven. Then this resolves to G flat major seven, and here. He um, first has again a leading note to B flat because then we move that down again. So now we have leading notes to the third of the chord, and then going up to the root. And from here, this needs to move to E minor. So he does that by moving the two lower notes up a half step again, and then we get a leading note to the B, which is the fifth of the chord. And then again up to the same G flat, or in this case, it's more like a like an F sharp on the E minor, so the, the ninth. So this is all sort of just moving in a pretty elegant way through the changes, which are essentially Coltrane changes. And uh, then he needs to resolve this. This is now becoming a part of a 2-5 to D major. And uh, the way he does that is that he's using the E minor, then kind of turning that into F minor, and then moving it up to, to an F sharp minor, because that works really well as a, as a way of getting to the to the D major 7, uh, which is similar to what he did in the first example with the chords where it's this kind of movement. Uh, so he breaks the rhythmical pattern. Until now it's been all like uh, three quarter note patterns, but once he gets to the E minor he just starts moving so that they're uh, half a bar long and that gives him the time to just neatly resolve on the A on the D major 7. If you want to check out another video on a guitar player with a unique and extremely strong sense of melody, then check out this video where I'm analyzing some phrases from a Kurt Rosenwinkel solo. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar and this is the first time you see one of my videos, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. That's about it for this week. Thank you for watching and until next week.